Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to be hosting today's session of Thoracic Gurus. Uh, today, we really have uh, one of the true gurus in thoracic surgery who has led uh, thoracic surgery in India and across the world, actually, over the last uh, many years, 20 plus years. He, has, he started off as a cardiothoracic surgeon and then he saw the need for uh, a surgeon to focus totally on the management of patients with pulmonary tuberculosis. And uh, he gave up his life and his whole concentration on uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, he is the director of thoracic surgery at National Institute of Tuberculosis, uh, which was previously known as LRS TB Hospital. And uh, he runs a very dynamic program uh, at this institution. Uh, he is an international speaker invited all across the world for his experience in management of uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, Dr. Devan, thank you very much for giving us your time. We really appreciate you, uh, you know, reaching out to our young audience. The audience here is actually across the world. We are relaying live to uh, not just on this forum, but this is going live on YouTube. It's going live on many uh, websites of various uh, international organizations. And people are, are, are listening to you. The audience is uh, a mixed bag. There are a lot of residents who are going in for exams, uh, people doing uh, MD, uh, DNB, uh, MCH, Thuras MCH, and also people who are doing FRCS and uh, uh, European Fellowship. So, uh, and, and, and there are also some very senior surgeons on the, on the forum who are listening to your uh, advice and who are keen to learn about the management of pulmonary tuberculosis. So Dr. Divan, the floor is all yours. Uh, take it away, please. Uh, hello? Uh, sir, can't hear. Okay, wait, wait. We'll do it. Sir, we are now live with you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for such a kind introduction, as well as giving me an opportunity to share this platform in which uh, so many senior surgeons as well as young doctors are joining me. And of course, I'm always so happy to share my thoughts about surgery for pulmonary tuberculosis, an area in which I'm working almost for continuously at least 80% of my work as a general thoracic surgeon concerns pulmonary tuberculosis. As all of us know that tuberculosis involves all other organs of the body, but I'm concerned in pulmonary tuberculosis as being thoracic surgeons, that concerns us maximum. I start with some basic epidemiology, which is of course, which may be boring to an audience of surgeons, but very important that globally, this is according to the global TB report, which came in 2019. The report uh, gives the data about 2018 and the data of 2019 would have come in the year 2020 global TB report which has now been of course stalled because of the COVID epidemic that we are in. So globally around 10 million people developed tuberculosis in 2018 and less than five countries had more than 500 new cases per 100,000 population and global average being around 130 per 100,000 population. The important point in this is to see that the one, there were 1.2 million TB deaths in HIV negative TB patients. So these deaths you see still are much larger than the deaths we, that we have seen from COVID epidemic. But of course, COVID epidemic has seen them in a very short duration of time. But this was an yearly figure of deaths. An additional 251,000 deaths were in HIV positive cases. The thing to be noticed is that these are reductions from the number percentage of deaths or the absolute number of deaths that we were having in the year 2000. There was 27% reduction in those who were HIV negative and 60% reduction in those who were HIV positive. Something which shows that our efforts to treat TB and TB HIV epidemic is showing some results a bit slowly. TB affects people of both sexes in all age groups, but the highest burden is in men aged 15 years and above, and they account for 57% of all cases. So these are the people who are also the breadwinners of most of the families. So its economic burden is even more than the medical burden. Women constitute 32% and children 11%. Among all TB cases, 
only 8.6 percent were people living with HIV. So though though we tend to think that TB and HIV is the real problem, of course it is a problem, but nevertheless we still have majority of the cases are not not with the HIV. And it is one of the top 10 causes of death worldwide and the leading cause of death from a single infectious agent, agent ranking above HIV AIDS. But now, of course, Corona has changed the entire equation about it. About a quarter of the world's population is infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis and thus at risk of developing TB disease. The important point to note is that eight countries accounted for two thirds of the global total and India tops the list with 27% of patients being from India. 9% from China, 8% from Indonesia, Philippines 6%, Pakistan 6%, Nigeria 4%, Bangladesh 4%, and South Africa 33%. And these and 22 other countries in WHO's list of 30 high burden countries accounted for 87% of the world's cases. So this shows a skewed distribution of TB as a problem in the world. So some countries have has an excessive burden and some countries have very few cases of TB. These were the now revised National Tuberculosis Control Program is named as National TB Elimination Program because of the gains which have been made in last 20 years. So people thought that we can eliminate tuberculosis and efforts were being done towards that direction, which I must say have got a little hard because of the COVID epidemic. There's a very ambitious project in which we had uh, aimed to decrease the percentage reduction in TB incidence to 80% of the present incidence by the year 2030. But our Prime Minister declared that we will do it by 2025. So we are, this is a very ambitious project and a very important project if one looks at the overall socio-economic situation of the world. But what's important here is that when I say 10 million people, that is just the incidence in the last year recorded. But the people who have suffered tuberculosis or who are harboring the infection or who are suffering the sequelae of tuberculosis are at least 2 billion. And I believe, though there is no data to back up, that at least 5% of these patients during the course of their history of tuberculosis do require some kind of surgical intervention. So that's a huge number. So most of the thoracic surgery across the world wrestles mostly with lung cancer or malignancy. But several parts of the world continue to deal with tuberculosis and its sequelae and its problems which I'll be dealing with in my talk further on as a surgeon. Now, before I come to surgery, important point is that we can roughly divide the four phases of therapeutic approaches to TB. If we take the modern era from late 19th century onwards, the first period which roughly starts around 1860 consisted of fresh air, rest, sunshine, nutrition, etc. and isolation at sanatoria. But the second period was basically surgical treatment and most of the thoracic surgery developed actually as a consequence of methods to treat tuberculosis, whether by collapse techniques, thoracotomy or resectional surgery. But in 1945, anti-tubercular drug therapy changed the entire scenario. And at least in the West, the need for surgical intervention decreased considerably. But later on, as of now, for the last 40 or 50 years, Combining medical therapy with adjuvant surgery as and when needed, especially for the resistant cases, is the approach. So, just to recapitulate, introduction of successful anti-tubercular chemotherapy decreased the need of surgical intervention. So, most TB surgeons actually took to developing cardiac surgery which, or lung cancer surgery, which was uh, taking greater attention and a lot of developments took in that area. But the need for surgery in India always remained considerable because of sheer number of cases. With MDR, TB and HIV, the West rediscovered interest in the subject. Most of the publications which have been coming after that are retrospective analysis, case reports, anecdotal evidence or expert opinions. So even my talk is based, of course, on all the literature which is available as well as the thoughts which I have distilled and collected over the period of my practice. 25 years plus practice. It is very difficult to conduct prospective trials for defining indications of surgical intervention in tuberculosis, though some attempts have been made. There are several publications which, are in, which detail the various 
indications of pulmonary surgery in uh, thoracic tuberculosis there are excellent reviews which have been published but broadly speaking we can divide all those indications into three main indications one is diagnostic when a surgeon does any kind of thoracic intervention for diagnosing tuberculosis second main area is active pulmonary tuberculosis which means we are doing surgery when the sputum is persistently positive it's important to realize that all these patients are not mdr tb so majority of them are drug resistant tuberculosis but the largest component consists of patients suffering from complications and sequelae of tuberculosis these complications can be hemoptysis which is the most common one which calls for a surgical attention destroyed lungs causing various kinds of symptoms destroyed lungs also includes bronchiectasis persistent cavities or any distortion in the lung anatomy then empyema mediastinal lymph node abscess paravertebral abscess osteomyelitic ribs etc and a large component of tracheobronchial disorders which also need some kind of surgical or bronchoscopic interventions so diagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis where do we require surgical intervention it can be done by flexible or rigid bronchoscopy especially in patients who do not expectorate sufficient amount of sputum and to obtain bronchial washings for sputum smear examination and it is also useful to exclude endobronchial disease bronchostenosis or coincident malignancy generally bronchoscopy is not required but some cases you may require it. thoracotomy or thoracoscopic biopsy thoracotomy will be very rarely required for just diagnostic purposes but a thoracoscopic biopsy may be needed to obtain tissue samples in lesions where other diagnostic modalities have failed or sometimes to sample suspicious lesions in pleura lung or mediastinal nodes and generally to rule out malignancy at least in countries like india we see many cases in which a suspicious nodule appears to be malignant but when you do the work up it turns out to be tuberculosis mediastinoscopy and mediastinotomy may also be required to assess a mediastinal lymph node sometimes now just to show as an ex uh, example this is a patient who had presented with left opaque hemithorax and while doing bronchoscopy we could see that there was a caseating lymph node which, which was projecting from the left main bronchus otherwise we could not have diagnosed it sputum smear was negative once we took a biopsy or we tried to remove this lymph node bronchoscopically then tuberculosis could be diagnosed and this was what the caseous lymph node which was removed at bronchoscopy so at least people working in for tuberculosis should be very proficient with bronchoscopy also which will be very useful in diagnosis and management and then thoracoscopic biopsy of course this this is of course a uh, diagram taking from which in which media and lymph nodes are being sampled this could be for malignant lesion but this is just a representative diagram but sometimes these thoracoscopic biopsies may yield tuberculosis and media stenoscopy very often we require we require to diagnose a media stenal lymph node which is present and the diagnosis could be tuberculosis malignancy or sarcoidosis nowadays ebus has replaced media stenoscopy but very often ebus because of the tiny tissue specimens which are received is not able to diagnose and media stenoscopy is required to be done sometimes those lymph nodes form large abscesses in media stenum and media stenoscopy also affords us an opportunity to drain those abscesses now the, this is the most important and most, most exciting area active pulmonary tuberculosis does surgery still have a role to treat tuberculosis of course the treatment of tuberculosis nowadays is medical and as you know that in the dot strategy recommended by the who we have made several changes nowadays we do a fixed drug combination which is directly observed as well as drug therapy for multi drug resistant tuberculosis has been very clearly defined but in active pulmonary tuberculosis sometimes surgery may be required in the following situations when there is failure of chemotherapy or there is progression of disease despite therapy 
give the rehab oh the diet very often most of the surgeons i must have seen that when surgery is done for either suspected or unsuspected disease with or without pre operative chemotherapy but the specimen shows active tubercular bacteria being still present so that means you have removed a specimen of lung in which tuberculosis was still active there are no clear cut indications of surgery in a patient with active disease and no proven drug resistance nevertheless if curative surgical resection should be offered to patient who have localized detectable disease and at least have these one of these follow this is tuberculosis is a medical disease decision to do surgery to remove tuberculosis from lungs should not be taken lightly it should be indicated clearly if the sputum is positive despite at least 4 months of supervised chemotherapy if there have been two or more relapses following chemotherapy one or more relapse while being on chemotherapy is a definite indication repeated default or non compliance may occasionally be an indication to add surgical resection if possible in a given case and this vague looking indication likely relapse in the judgment of the treating physician is very important is in cases of tuberculosis the physician and surgeon sit together see the radiographs of the patient they feel that such such kind of a cavity will not completely heal on medical treatment alone and surgical resection is added in addition to the medical management then the results of making the patient sputum negative and keeping him sputum negative increase much further and then as i mentioned in the last slide also many patients operated upon for sequel or complications turn out to be harboring active disease on histopathology so this is an example of surgery in active permanent tuberculosis one if one looks at this x ray even a physician will agree that even if we treat this patient completely with anti tubercular medicine and he becomes sputum negative also is likely to become positive again so it is better to remove this destroyed lung which is harboring several cavities which will continue to harbor bacteria which will become active at some later stage so and this lung is never going to completely clear up so it's better to remove this lung in addition to give addition complete anti tubercular therapy and this is a very common scenario especially on the left side now drug resistant tb when do we do surgery in drug resistant tb first it is important to understand the definition of drug resistant tb multi drug resistant tb is a form of tb with high level resistance to both isoniazid and rifampicin with or without associated resistance to other other anti tuberculosis drugs and what is extremely drug resistant to be which is defined as resistance to at least isoniazid and rifampicin and to any fluoroquinolone and to any of the three second line injectables these definitions have been completely frozen by the experts looking after tb program by the, in the who and accordingly patients are treated various medical management protocols are defined the medical treatment of mdr tb is prolonged toxic suboptimal with a predicted success rate of less than 50% compared to over 90% for drug susceptible strains now this was this is a general understanding but of course in the global tb report 2019 a multi drug resistant tb has a success rate of 56% xdr has a success rate of 39% now as of now and that that treatment also is getting further refined we have three kinds of treatment for multi drug resistant tb earlier we used to have a long long re longer regimen of consisting of 18 months then we had a shorter regimen consisting of injectables and now we have a shorter regimen all oral short regimen which is also 8 9 months and this is likely to become the standard treatment of mdr tb with the introduction of new drugs like bedaquilin and delanamide the success rate is increasing and the indications of surgery have to be defined and refined much more clearly this is an area which is evolving daily as new new drugs are being added and as the program of tb control is becoming more refined but one of the problems with surgeons encounter are that most of the cases have got bilateral lesions and hence are not suitable for surgery reasons for resection in patients with cavitary disease are difficulty of antibiotic penetration and high number of organisms contained within the cavity which may range from 10 raised to the power 7 to 10 raised to the power 9 organisms per cavity and tb cavity 
is an ideal growth for its growth environment because its wall can restrict drug penetration. Important point to see here is that the uh, patient must still be sputum positive. Many people feel that for MDR TB, let the drugs be given and patient should become sputum negative before patients are taken for surgery. This is not true. We have to sometimes take up the patient for surgery even when they continue to be sputum positive. In fact, the indication is because of the cavity, the patient is not becoming sputum negative. So we have to add surgery. The cavity wall protects mycobacterium tuberculosis from the host's immune defenses. And after removal of a major TB focus, the immune responses to residual infection might be enhanced. Similar to paradoxical reactions sometimes noted during TB treatment, many surgeons may not know that many times when we are start anti-tubercular therapy, sometimes the lesions, because the, bacteria, the bacterial load decreases, the immune response of the body increases and that further leads to destruction of the tissues. And that's why if you remove the TB focus, the immune response becomes better and patient gets healed fast. So what are the indications in patients of MDR TB? Failure to convert despite an adequate drug, drug regime, regimen with at least four drugs to which the resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis strain is sensitive out of which at least three had, been pre had not been used previously for more than six months before failure. This looks complex, but it is important to understand that we cannot take up every case. There has to be correct indication. And MDR-TB with additional resistance to second line drugs or XDR-TB is always an indication if it is possible to add surgical resection, if there's a localized disease in XDR-TB, please always do surgical intervention because these are the cases which may be lost otherwise. Indications of surgery in MDR-TB patients, if the cavities are more than 10 cm in size or extensive fibrosis of the lung, just as the X-ray which I showed, previous non-adherence to treatment, when a patient interrupts more than 20% of the doses, and if we can add surgery, probably we may help that patient better. If there's a high basilary load before starting the treatment, and sometimes some comorbidities like diabetes, COPD, HIV, low BMI, alcoholism, etc., which are generally speaking contraindications to surgery actually become indications of surgery in some selected cases where we feel the disease is localized, patient is unlikely to get well by medical therapy alone, and if we add surgical intervention, then patient will like likely to become better. We have to understand that many cases of MDR TB and XDR TB are desperate cases, and surgery offers an additional opportunity to help the patient. Additional considerations are that reserv reservoir of res resistant bacteria cannot be located. They may lie in residual nodules, bullae, microcavitation, or even fibrosis. So it is imperative to resect all the diseased areas to reduce relapses. Sometimes worthwhile to resect even if conversion has taken place as relapse is very likely. See. That's why sometimes when we take up a patient for lobectomy, but we feel that there's sufficient number of nodules in the remaining the other lobe also, it is better to go ahead with the pneumonectomy straight away rather than getting the patient to suffer a relapse. And that is the kind of a judgment which sometimes surgeons still have to make in, in the area of tuberculosis on the operation table by palpation. Now, this is a typical case of DRTB. If you can see, there's a large cavity, almost destroyed lung. But this patient, I'm setting as an example, this has bilateral lesions. This X-ray doesn't clearly show, but there are sufficient lesions on the right side. So this patient cannot be offered pneumonectomy. One should never take up a case for pneumonectomy if there are sufficient lesions on the other side also. So such cases are still treated with thoracoplasty. Intraoperative photograph of thoracoplasty and epicolysis in which we collapse this cavity by removing upper five ribs and do the complete epicolysis and this cavity collapses. This was the first operation devised for treatment of tuberculosis in the pre-chemotherapeutic era, but is still useful in occasional cases. And this is how the x-ray looks like. This cavity is completely collapsed and you can see this x-ray shows better that there were lesions on the other side also. And this patient, despite being drug resistant, and this is a very old x-ray I'm showing when we did not have good drugs also. And he continued to remain sputum negative because of this thoracoplasty operation. 
Now, this is a case of ex extremely drug-resistant TB, who presented with right-sided lesions. As I mentioned earlier, we took up for right upper lobectomy. But later on, on operation table, we found that these nodules were sufficiently big enough, and we ended up doing a right-sided pneumonectomy, and patient became sputum negative and continued to remain sputum negative. MDR right upper lobectomy. Now, this is a typical case of an aspergilloma within a cavity, but this was a patient of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Means the cavity has been removed, uh, the upper lobe has been removed, and the lower lobe has expanded to fill up the thoracic cavity, and patient became all right. Now, this is a there's a condition called pre-XDRTB, in which right upper lobe localized disease was there. Once we see an area in which there is a localized disease, these localized cases, then we do take up for surgery because we can dissect these portions and then the, patient, the chances of patient becoming sputum negative and remaining sputum negative are much higher. Now, this is active pulmonary tuberculosis. When we intervene surgically to treat tuberculosis, because you see most of the programs of tuberculosis control are generally directed at making the patient sputum negative and symptom free at the moment. But as I mentioned earlier, that the history of patient of tuberculosis does not end with this becomes sputum negative. This may be important from the epidemiological and program point of view. But many patients continue to suffer post pulmonary, post TB pulmonary disorders. Now, this number is huge. In the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned that almost 2 billion of the population of the world may be, this is the prevalence of TB may be there in 2, 2 billion people across the globe over a period of for many years. So many of these patients, at least four to five percent, will require some surgical intervention. Post-TB pulmonary disorders are associated with frequent pulmonary damage despite microbiological cure. The microbiological cure, which interests epidemiologists and physicians maximum, is not the complete cure for the patient. Patients with treated TB may remain lifelong sufferers of disabling structural and functional sequelae of disease which subsequently impair their quality of life. It is important to be aware of the full spectrum of these disorders to facilitate early diagnosis and management. The prevalence of these abnormalities among patients completing anti-TB drugs is alarmingly high, it is 40 to 75 percent. In fact, some studies suggest greater morbidities from sequelae rather than from the disease itself. So what are these disorders? They can be in the airway, subglottic stenosis, chronic obstructive airflow obstruction, bronchiectasis, tracheobronchial stenosis, broncholithiasis, pleural disorders, pleural thickening, severe fibrothorax, and then disorders in the parenchyma, thin -walled, walled cavity, which is called open negative syndrome. The patient is put on negative, but is likely to become positive again because the cavity wall is very thin. Lung fibrosis with structural destruction, scar carcinoma occasionally, vascular lesions, and Rasmussen aneurysm. Bronchiectasis is the commonest post TB sequelae, up to 60%, and the apical and posterior segments of the upper lobe are commonly involved. And what are the presentation? It is not that the bronchiectasis is present. We don't treat an X ray, we treat the symptoms which patient is suffering from. The symptoms are persistent or recurrent cough. Purulent sputum, hemoptysis, dyspnea, wheezing, fatigue, fever, and failure to thrive. And very often these patients end up getting recurrent courses of anti tubercular therapy, which are not actually indicated, which is a wrong therapy, because most of these symptoms occur of super added infections on the cavities or destroyed lung segment, which is present. Dry bronchiectasis or bronchiectasis sicca, and the causes are fibrosis atelectasis, bronchial stenosis, or compression by an enlarged lymph node, or rupture of a calcified node into bronchus. Because these symptoms are very debilitating. Patients are repeatedly coming to the hospital, and surgeries in very, some of these cases, not all of these cases, can offer long-lasting relief to the patient. So these are the cases of bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis in the left lower zone, this side, left side almost completely destroyed, mainly in the upper lobe, then these multiple cavities, bronchiectatic, almost completely, and CT scan also showing destroyed lung. Now, even from common sense, one can feel that these patients are never likely to become completely cured until unless we remove this offending segment, 
provided we can afford to do it. Always the caveat is that the patient should have a normal other lung and sufficient pulmonary reserve lung function test to be able to tolerate these surgeries. These are other bronchiectasis pictures, almost completely destroyed, right side destroyed here, destroyed here. Very often patients, people working in TB hospitals have seen these x-rays, they are the commonest x-rays that we see. Aspergilloma is another major area, which is a fungus ball composed of aspergillus hyphae, fibrin, mucus, and cellular debris, which is found within a pre-existing pulmonary cavity. Its commonest site is upper lobes. Incidence is 0.1 to 17%. It is the most common preceding lung lesion in an open heel tuberculosis cavity. The incidence of cavitary TB being affected by aspergilloma is 11 to 17%. And interval between diagnosis of TB and development of aspergilloma may vary from less than a year to 30 years. Average is 9.2 years. Now, because our most common operation that we do is for aspergilloma, one can see that they've had a long history of disease. And this long history makes TB surgery especially challenging and difficult. These are the aspergillomas. These are the various aspergillomas which are present. I think that's an area all of us, you must have seen these things. Then tracheobronchial stenosis, the most serious complication of endobronchial TB. It happens in 60 to 90 percent of endobronchial TB. Predominance in the female sex and left main bronchus is the commonest site of stenosis. It develops despite adequate ATT. The patient gets microbiological control. <laughs> Anything? <laughs> Signs and symptoms are cough, wheezing, dyspnea, strider, respiratory failure. The diagnosis is made by spirometry, flexible bronchoscopy, and CT chest. Management may include bronchoscopic techniques, which include balloon dilatation alone, stent placement following balloon dilatation, laser photoresection, argon plasma coagulation, and cryotherapy. But sometimes surgical resection with bronchoplastic reconstruction can be done. But very often, especially on the left main bronchus, the lung distal to these bronchostomic segments are so diseased that you may end up doing a pneumonectomy. These are the tracheobronchial stenosis. One can see on the left side, the stenosis compared to the right side. The bronchoscopy is showing a severe stenosis here. The 3D reconstruction shows the stenosis segment of bronchus, left side. More common on left side. This is very common. This is also because the lymph nodes which are present here may be compressing this bronchial segment. Destroyed lung. Unilateral destruction of the lung due to tuberculosis. It causes cicatrization and atelectasis. It's a common finding after post-primary tuberculosis. X-ray chest shows reduced lung volume, cavities, bronchiectasis, and fibrosis. And the complications are same, hemoptysis and secondary infection. And these are the various destroyed lungs. Complete, you can't see the lung on one side. And very often, the other side of the lung herniates. And these patients, if they have sufficient symptoms, they are obvious candidates for surgery and should always be offered surgery. Scar carcinoma, which is a peripherally located tumor with no, no evidence of bronchial origin. It occurs around a true hyalinized scar, most common in upper lobes, and usually it is adenocarcinoma. The pathogenesis is unclear. Uncontrolled epithelial hyperplasia in relation to fibrosis is considered as a possible mechanism. But Cigarette smoking is also seen in many of these cases, so it is very difficult to say whether the previous tuberculosis lesion has become carcinoma or is carcinoma developed per se. It is mentioned in literature, but uh, we have seen it very, very rarely. Hemoptysis is the common, and I think Dr. Khan had a lecture on hemoptysis, and management of hemoptysis. Its incidence is 30 to 35%. Causes are Rasmussen aneurysm, bronchiectasis, aspergilloma, scar carcinoma, uh, treatment is first rest, which in, an increased fluid intake, bronchoscopy and bronchial artery embolization, especially if there's a massive hemoptysis, then bronchial artery embolization is the best intervention which tempor temporarily controls the situation and makes the patient suitable for surgery later on. This is a case in which we have to do a resection for massive hemoptysis. Uh, this is a Rasmussen aneurysm. It's a kind of arteriovenous aneurysm in the pulmonary vasculature at the junction of arteries and veins or in the capillary level. 
and these can rupture and cause exsanguinating hemorrhages. The most dangerous cases are Rasmussen aneurysm. If there is no history of hemoptysis, but radiological investigations reveal a Rasmussen aneurysm, these patients should be offered surgery electively without a history of hemoptysis also. Spontaneous pneumothorax, it's a complication in cavity TB, 5 to 15% of the patients. May, there's a greater preponderance of males developing it. Right side is more common. Clinical symptoms are dependent on the degree of collapse of the underlying lung. Treatment is generally tube thoracoplast thoracostomy. And if there, there's a high failure because bronchopleural fistula is present, and then one may have to do further surgeries like decortication or thoracoplasty. So what are the procedures that we do for post-TB disorders? Most common is, of, of course, lung resections, which can be pneumonectomy, lobectomy, or segmental resection. The lung resection of TB is different from lung resection from malignancy in the sense that we have to be as conservative as possible because here you are not doing for malignancy as the cause. So we should preserve as much lung as possible and lymph node dissection is not necessary. But as I mentioned earlier in my slides, collapse therapy or thoracoplasty may be occasionally indicated in some cases. Intervention of bronchoscopic procedures. And the most common presentation is of empyma, which is treated according to its stage of presentation. Empyma is a separate topic in itself, which is a stage of presentation with tube thoracostomy, rib resection, window thoracostomy, decortication, or thoracoplasty. And several other procedures. I've just mentioned others. This can be, you may help in orthopedic surgeon, drain a paravertebral abscess by thoracoscopic or thoracotomy approach. You may have to remove a lymph node which is compressing your bronchus, an abscess which is present inside, the ribs which have become osteomyelitic may have to be removed, or sometimes there has to be plastic, thoracoplastic procedures done to reconstruct a chest wall which has become severely deformed. This is according to the sequelae the tuberculosis leaves and the surgery is decided accordingly. There's a long list of procedures which may be required in cases. So I'm not generally not given references. There are publications nowadays, the, of course, and reviews, which have come more generally from former Soviet Union republics, as well as uh, Pakistan and uh, Singapore, etc. But there are fewer, actually fewer publications relating to surgery for pulmonary tuberculosis, and most of them are retrospective analysis and case reports. This is post pneumonectomy x-ray. This is a post thoracoplasty x-ray because it is in my collection. I wish to present it to show that this kind of an x-ray can still be seen and required, though it should be a rarity in these days, but it is required fairly often. And this is an aspergilloma in a cavity when you this is another aspergilloma. Now, Dr. Khan is a great proponent of minimal exercise. Such an aspergilloma can be easily done through a video assisted thoracoscopic approach because it is peripheral. But many of the aspergillomas, now I'll come to the surgical approaches. Another procedure that I wish to mention is physiological exclusion. Many, this was a procedure done in very rare cases. These are the two cases in which we did physiological exclusion. What is this procedure? It was described by an Indian surgeon called Dr. Dhaliwal because many times we had seen that those cases with history of tuberculosis who had a long lasting history like more than 10 years, 12 years, they have a severe fibrosis and the lung, even while opening, doing the thoracotomy, severe hemorrhage takes place and patients are occasionally lost while doing the, while releasing the lung all over from the chest wall. In these situations, we described a procedure with, from mid sternotomy, we take control of the pulmonary artery divide the pulmonary artery and then divide the bron bronchus, main bronchus and leave the pulmonary veins intact and leave the lung tissue also present within it. It, con it was indicated only in cases in which the symptom was hemoptysis because otherwise patient would have died by intraoperative hemorrhage. And we, for only these two cases, we found this procedure to be suitable because we knew that it is such a severe fibrothorax that entry into chest and trying to release this lung all over would lead into severe problems. And for, though, of course, we don't have large experience with this procedure, but sometimes it's a reserve procedure which can give it long lasting relief because we have done these cases after 17, 18 years of history of TB. And then after doing the procedure, they are symptom free. They never had a hemoptysis again and developed no complications also. 
what are the operative considerations? Most important is that tubercular surgery, they are dense adhesions which make dissection quite challenging. They have to be liberal use of electrocautery and sufficient amount of blood has to be arranged. Bronchial stump is closed with mechanical stapling devices and hand sewn technique. VAT's approach is generally inappropriate, but in cases presenting early and with sufficient experience, it can be useful in occasional cases. Extra pleural mobilization is required quite often, especially in upper lobe lesions. And intrapericardial control is required if the hilum is totally frozen or some major injury takes place while mobilizing. These are technically difficult cases, generally speaking, and uh, what are the technical difficulties usually encountered during TB surgery? See, the, we have some of the videos I'll show. See, this is a destroyed lung being taken up for surgery. Hi, everybody. Steve Simon here. Oh, sorry. This is a left destroyed lung. Generally, these cases, when we open the chest, see, it takes a long time to mobilize. There's almost no space which is available while you're mobilizing the lung. It has to be a careful procedure. Otherwise, lungs can get severe injuries and there may be a lot of hemorrhage. I made these, these videos are available on YouTube. These references are being given here. One can see them at leisure, but important points are mentioned that first the mobilization of lung itself is difficult. And it has to be done slowly in a deliberate manner, opening the pleura, not damaging the lung parenchyma. And this is the mobilization of lung. This was what I was mentioning that it is difficult and it takes a lot of time, especially at the apex, because most of the tuberculosis disease is present in the apex and it, it requires a lot of hand mobilization and slow opening of the chest retractor. Occasionally, if you open the chest retractor very fast, then it causes a lot of rib fractures, which is responsible for post thoracotomy pain. All of us know that thoracotomy causes a lot of post-operative pain. And that's why minimal access surgery has become the norm, in at, at least in the area of malignancy. But in several cases of tuberculosis, it may not be possible because you do, can't get sufficient access. And then one has to mobilize slowly. That's the trick and be very patient about it and slowly open the retractor. Most of the pain is also because of the fast opening of the chest cavity, which causes rib fractures. Occasionally, you may have to do a rib resection to be able to get complete space and mobilizing the lung. Now, I'll just... The structures, you see on the left side, while you are doing the mobilization, the apex, it is very important that you don't end up injuring the left subclavian artery. Similarly, at the posterior portion, sometimes the aorta, mobilization of the lung from subclavian artery, aortic arch, pericardium, and diaphragm, and other, all these areas. It has to be done carefully. These are still adhesions being mobilized. Careful use of cautery to skeletonize the vessels are necessary near the pulmonary vessel, but still the lung is being mobilized over the aorta. These are adhesions which are being mobilized. Now, 
one of the tricks I say that even if you are doing a right upper lobe, upper lobectomy or pneumonectomy or lower lobectomy, most important is to take control of the inferior pulmonary vein first. Don't divide the inferior pulmonary vein first, then take control of the pulmonary artery, divide it into ligatures, then divide the inferior pulmonary vein, then divide the superior pulmonary vein, and then go to the bronchus. This kind of a sequence is maintained, at least in the beginning when you're not sufficiently experienced. This makes for the safest surgery. Of course, I'm not letting the whole video be there. Just showing the important points here that this is the inferior pulmonary vein being dissected. This is the inferior pulmonary vein being dissected. And the tissues can be cut with cautery over after taking control with the right angle vessel forceps. But as you see, even the adhesions are quite vascular. Even after being div divided by uh, electrocautery, they still continue to ooze a lot. This is the inferior pulmonary vein being taken. The control is being taken of the inferior pulmonary vein. This is unfavorable. This is a stapler being applied to them. So even in open thoracotomy, endostaplers, we still use endostaplers because they offer a very good control over the vessels and rather than tying between ligatures, which can of course be done, but staplers are very handy. Of course, the technique, this is a standard lung resection technique. What I wish to emphasize was that in tuberculosis, these are the some YouTube videos and which are highlighting the usual difficulties. If we go through these videos carefully, one can see those difficulties are generally caused by adhesions and distortion of anatomy. And what is most important in the surgeon's mind is the possibility of uncontrollable hemorrhage from pulmonary vessels. Which, and that's why it has to be done very carefully, deliberately, and after some experience. Now, what about video assisted thoracoscopic surgery and robotic assisted thoracoscopic surgery? They are becoming popular and have caught the imagination of most thoracic surgeons. In India, Dr. Khan is the leading person who has developed a lot of uh, the possibility that many cases of TB and TB sequelae can also be dealt with very well by video assisted or robotic assisted approach. Generally, these cases are those which have an early presentation and nature of the lesion makes it amenable to minimal access surgery. And the important point in minimal access is if you get a, a opening to the chest where you can put your telescope, after that, don't divide the adhesions. First go for the vessels, take control, because adhesions, especially at the upper lobe, actually act as a kind of a retractor, which keeps the lung on, and adhesions can be divided later on after dissecting the vessels, taking their control with staplers, and doing the bronchial dissection, and after that, whether you are doing a lobectomy or pneumonectomy, can take the control later on. The TB surgery, one of the important things that I wish to say repeatedly, is that though the TB is a disease of the poor, but TB surgery is not a not a low, low cost intervention. It's best because it's a very dangerous surgery. It is better that all the latest gadgets and equipments are available while one is taking up a case for TB surgery, which of course include double lumen endotracheal tube and bronchial blockers, pediatric flexible bronchoscopy. I mentioned these things, these things are taken up as a routine nowadays. We started our thoracic surgical practice when these things are not available and we encountered a lot of difficulties and know what kind of a quality addition to the safety and reliability of surgery in TB has been done by mechanical surgical staplers, tissue patch, fibrin glue, 
argon beam coagulation, ultrasonic coagulation and cutting system, and digital portable chest drainage system having adjustable suction. And of course, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery and that, which of course, in many situations, we can get away with this minimal access approach and not subject the patient to a full fledged thoracotomy. However, these improvements have increased cost and not, are not readily available in developing countries or emerging economies, at least in many centers, many peripheral areas of these countries. And as I'm seeing in the post COVID world, this to tuberculosis because many TB patients have not got adequate treatment and we will get a lot of surgical cases which will require some kind of intervention. There will be a lot of strain on the financial resources of healthcare systems. And one may have to very judiciously use these technologies which are available. But I feel that these minimum technologies are very important in improving the results of TB surgery. Post-operative care standard, initially they're maintained in ICU, respiratory exercises, pain management, in incentive spirometer. And I again wish to re-emphasize that digital portable chest drainage system is a significant value addition in this management. Because in TB especially, suppose you're doing a lobectomy, the rest of the lung also has got some fibrotic lesions. And those fi that's why the lung cannot expand completely. And digital portable chest drainage suction system increases the, uh, decreases the number of days in which we have to use chest drainage and helps in lung expansion and gives better post-operative result. It's an extremely useful value addition in the armamentarium of thoracic surgeons dealing with TB cases. What are the contraindications to surgery? Some of the very many number of cases will be referred to all those thoracic surgeons who are working in an area where TB is rampant, but they have to realize that they don't have to operate if there is bilateral extensive disease. If there is an ex active disease at the proposed bronchial stump site, one should never operate because that will definitely lead to bronchopleural fistula till the bronchial stump heals completely. And that is why before doing a lung resection for TB, one should do a bronchoscopy to see what is the proposed bronchial stump. Is it healthy or not? If there is poor general condition, unfit to tolerate general anesthesia. Lung function test is very important. We have criteria to do when we can take up a patient for lobectomy, when for pneumonectomy or for a vegetary section, and they should be strictly adhered to. Though in a given case, one can relax those criteria according to a given situation. And it should be a combined dis decision between physician, surgeon, and anesthetist that which case is suitable for surgery and which case is not suitable for surgery. Poor nutritional status or cardiopulmonary reserve. Nutritional status BMI below 18 is a contraindication to surgery. Such patients, in our institution, we admit those cases, give them some rest as well as adequate nutrition and build up those cases till they are sufficiently, uh, they have sufficient amount of weight to tolerate surgery. And non-significant symptoms. An X-ray should not be treated. Generally, a symptom should be treated. Post-TB sequelae, if there is a fibrotic nodule lying there, it does not require surgery, probably. And many of these cases will live an entire life lifetime without getting any symptoms. So until unless they develop sufficient symptoms, one should not be operating, but except in the situation of a Rasmussen aneurysm, which, is, which can be detected or a large aspergilloma, which is detected, then one should go ahead with operation, even though the patient may not be having symptoms. Very important area, protection of OT personnel during TB surgery. These are the things because TB surgery will be done in various area, parts of the world with various different levels of sophistication of healthcare. There can, they can be co big corporate hospitals or peripheral TB hospitals. They should have at least laminar flow with regular air exchanges, positive air pressure, HEPA filters, disposable circuits, and N95 mask. And, and now in the post-COVID era, PPE probably also will catch the imagination of the people because all those healthcare personnel who are working in TB area are susceptible and multi-drug resistant TB is a very serious disease. And though all of our attention is directed at COVID nowadays, we should not forget that still more people die of TB than they have died of COVID so far. So, and these protective measures for all the OT personnel are important. And one of the things I can mention that at one point of time in South Africa, 19% of the healthcare workers working in TB hospitals had developed TB. So this is as serious as that. So in conclusion, surgery for tuberculosis is indicated as selected and carefully prepared case, cases. It's a high cost intervention, like should be undertaken in select units which have sufficient understanding and experience 
in this area and of, there are newer techniques which are developing day in and day out, day out but amalgamation of older and newer techniques in an optimal manner is the way forward so i think i will conclude here for taking up questions and clarifications dr khan thank you very much dr devan that was just an amazing lecture on on tuberculosis i have to say uh, it is just your experience and your knowledge in the subject is so intense and so vast uh, so I, I i have to say i was mesmerized i was listening to each one of your slide in so much detail excellent excellent thank you very much so uh, if if it's okay with you with time sir can i uh, do a question and answer sessions is that yes. is that all right Yes, I think are you are you all right for time, sir? I've not exceeded time, and I think we have sufficient time for. Questions. No, we don't. We are not worried about time. I'm worried about your time, sir. No, no, no. <laughs> all right. Okay. So there, there are a few questions which I will ask uh, because I want to clarify certain points for the audience, mm -hmm. and and the audience has been asking a lot of questions. So we'll go through each one of them uh, in in detail, and uh, the, the the first one you actually covered beautifully I, I really liked it where you spoke about uh, pre protection of the surgeon because you know most of us who who get into this world of tb surgery are worried about our own lives and and i i really like the fact that you had a whole slide on what are the strategies for protecting people from tb and and protecting the health personnel for tb what what, what do people do in hospitals where they have a mixed practice so say one day they have uh, you know um, first case could be a tuberculosis case and then second case could be something lung cancer so what are the strategies that surgeons should follow to make sure that uh, themselves and their patients are safe whenever they operate on a tb patient i suppose that it as i mentioned that they must have a laminar flow and constant air exchange and one mm -hmm. of the things which can be added is that the circuits the anesthesia circuit of course has to be changed after every case it has to be disposed of and hepa filters have to be placed within the anesthesia circuit and all the personnel who are operating for tb case especially mm -hmm. if it is a positive tb case should be having n95 masks okay and minimal number of people generally while doing positive cases we don't encourage many number of students and observers mm -hmm. should be minimum, minimum number of 40 personnel should be there and they should all be having n95 masks so far we are not having using ppes of course if there is an hiv patient in whom we are operating we use an hiv kit something called hiv kit to complete protection and which is which can be used as a matter of routine but the point i was making was that even if the hospital because tb surgery may have to be done even in some peripheral small towns or cities but these are the minimum things which should be present there otherwise they should not be encouraged because what about the instruments what about the instruments yeah. instruments are all autoclavable so there is no problem over the instruments so it's okay is it autoclave is all right for uh, the instrument to be reused uh, yes. on the next case absolutely right. because they are autoclavable and uh, those instruments like fiber optic bronchoscope etc which cannot be autoclave they should be sufficient there there are definite guidelines how you have to sterilize them after use and they should I be adhered there should be no hurry that one case has been done and it has to be used in the second case because sometimes yeah. putting into formaldehyde for at least 30 minutes is required so that should be adhered to and if an institution get can get a plasma sterilizer that is ideal because it can deal take care of the sterilization of sharps as well as endoscopic equipments as well as standard surgical instruments and so the sophistication of instruments sometimes even the thoracoscopic new thoracoscopic instrument some of which you have designed they are useful even in open surgery because they give access they are longer instruments so there those should be added as many instruments you can add and uh, one another important instrument is an aortic clamp you see sometimes torrential hemorrhage can take place and one should be prepared to have vascular clamps or aortic clamps to take care of that so that you do never lose the patient on table okay so so your 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 guidance to the general public is that if you have a open tb case on your list uh should it be done last on the list or is there some strategy that you should follow in an open tb case for a for a mixed practice surgeon expect it should be the last case in the list but uh, because i work in exclusively tb institution cases those cases when we are doing a positive case generally we keep it as a single case in that okay 
Okay, so you should try to keep it as a single case mm -hmm. and the theater should be shut down. Because in the UK, they get really, really upset uh, when there's a TB case and, and the whole hoo-ha starts. And uh, actually the... And, yes, uh, you know, I operated some cases in Armenia because that's a part of Europe. So all those European standards were applied. And we also had a biomedical engineer in the team who took mm -hmm. care to see that all the positive air exchanges are taking place correctly. He was taking a reading also that it was all yes. done in an optimal manner. Until the theater design is like that, that air exchange is complete, they will not allow. And everybody was wearing N95 mask with respect okay. to whoever was present in theater. Okay. Now, tell us, uh, how does HIV affect TB? Uh, is, is there a correlation between the two? Yeah. Uh, I think in the beginning of my slide, I mentioned yeah, that you did. Yeah. HIV related deaths are 250,000. They were in 2018, 250,000. And 8.6% of the cases of TB had were developed in people living with HIV. Now, the situation is earlier, what we were doing that every case of HIV, if he had symptoms of tuberculosis, while diagnosing TB, we were routinely using gene expert so that we can detect resistance at the beginning itself. Gene expert is cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test rather than doing this because otherwise TB was being diagnosed is put on smear examination. But for four groups, those who have already taken treatment, children, people living with HIV or any other contacts of drug resistant TB cases, it was mandatory by WHO to do their CBNET test in the beginning. The CBNET test is a genetic geno genotypic test which tells whether the patient is ref having rifampicin resistant TB in the beginning itself. Then he's worked up according to culture sensitivity reports and put on appropriate therapy. And the, okay. when they're diagnosed as drug resistant TB, they're simultaneously put on antiretroviral therapy also. Otherwise, oh, all of them are not put on antiretroviral therapy unless their CD4 count go below a particular value. But if they develop TB, then they are given ART in addition. But as far as the duration of their treatment, the recommendations are no different from any non-HIV case. The recommendations okay. of medical management so the are, same. is the same. But surgical management has to be very carefully looked into whether it is required because it, this, this also includes protection of the personnel. The case, but uh -huh. most of these cases of complications are empyma, which may require some kind of intervention, which should be gone ahead. There is no additional risk because all surgeons have to take universal precautions universally which will include a HIV kit, obviously, double gloves and all sharp instruments to be handed over carefully so that no injuries take place. And in case a person develops an exposure, then post-exposure post prophylaxis. Okay, fantastic. Now, in the current scenario with coronavirus, is, how does it impact TB patients? Is it uh, worse or is it the same as the general population, the risk of getting coronavirus? You see, we don't have data. I don't know. We don't have data. No, your experience in your hospital. Concerns, are you seeing more patients or less patients? Being experienced, no, the, on the contrary, because of the lockdown, the concerns are that the, the TB program is suffering badly. Many cases oh, are getting the drugs which they are supposed to get. So there is a guideline from government that all TB institutions should continue to give drugs directly or supervise it. Because you see, what was important in the TB control program was that patients were taking their drugs. They were supervised directly in the center. But that looks uh -huh. unfeasible. Now that they have added something called what? Video observe. If you through a video technology with a telephone, mobile, smartphone, one can show that I have taken the drive. That's what the emphasis is shifting on to. And the governments are trying their maximum to keep on giving the patients TB drugs. In our institution, our usual attendance of TB patients was 800 to 1000 per day. It has come down to 200 to 250 nowadays because of the difficulties that patients are not reaching. I'm sure that uh, the incidence of TB will continue to remain the same. It's unlikely, but of course, if social distancing and physical hygiene may make yeah. a difference, but we still don't have any data, you say. I see. Okay. And but, no, of course, COVID is a serious setback to the TB control uh, program. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Now, uh, the other question I want to ask you is, tell us what is the, you, you mentioned in your slides, I saw that, but just for to highlight for the audience, what is the incidence of lung cancer and tuberculosis? Yeah, uh, the scar carcinoma I mentioned in the slide. <laughs> yeah, is, what is the incidence? Is it a very common thing or is it a rarely uh, seen thing? Actually, I discussed, I have seen only one case. What has happened? Started. Uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, please don't share your screen. Hello, 
Hello, please don't share your screen. I, uh, sorry, just one second, sir. Somebody's. Yeah, I know this is this is crazy. Srinivas, we don't want to see your screen. Thank you. Okay. So, sorry, sir. Okay, carry on. I'm sorry, I forgot. Where were we? Uh, we were talking about uh, scar carcinoma and tuberculosis. Is it common yeah. or not common? I have never. I have seen only one case so far in which carcinoma and tuberculosis were simultaneously present in the specimens. And I've discussed with most of the TB physicians in Lucknow, etc., KGMC. They've also seen that the scar carcinoma is probably an overhyped thing. It is not seen very well. Okay. And the reverse in in the Indian population, yeah. when you're dealing with a lung cancer patient. And, and you get a pet positive lymph node. Uh, you know, what is the incidence of TB in these kind of patients? Uh, what is the data showing? Very high. I, I think somebody shared the slide like in the last conference, up to 30 to 40 percent of the cases of tuberculosis. Oh, I see. So 30 to 40. So you should not believe a pet positive. Absolutely. Uh, in, the, uh, in the scenario with high end endemic endemicity of TB, I think PET is a non reliable test. Non reliable. So you should always try and biopsy uh, the lymph node. What about mediastinoscopy in tuberculosis? Because of the fibrosis and things like that, do you think mediastinoscopy is a higher risk operation, uh, more difficult to do, or is it the same? You see, generally you will do a mediastinoscopy for a, when a lymph node is present. And those situations mm. are not more difficult. And sometimes actually abscesses develop and mediastinoscopy can also help you in drainage the abscess without doing it. So, 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 so the fibrosis doesn't make it any worse, is it? No. Uh, in certain situations, so for instance, some of the X-rays you saw, the trachea was deviated to the right or left side. Those situations are yeah. very difficult to do a media stream school. Okay. Now, now, the next question I want to ask you is about management of cold abscess. Let's restate uh, it for the youngsters. So, when do you operate or do you operate on every cold abscess? That, that's the question. It's a very specific sort of situation. Yeah. Cold abscess, uh, once it is diagnosed as a tubercular cold abscess, of course, the patient is on anti-tubercular therapy and the treatment is generally conservative. Initially, we just aspirate and continue to give anti-tubercular therapy and observe it for one month or so. If the abscess mm -hmm. is increasing in size or is not mm -hmm. decreasing despite therapy, then there is an indication for straight incision and drainage. Though traditionally, mm -hmm. the book has been writing that TV abscesses should not be drained. But we have mm -hmm. found that patients become better after drainage and that is the usual experience. After drainage, the abscess actually starts healing and getting fibrosed over the time. So it is better to drain if it is not responding. And in the, one of the slides I mentioned, there's something called paradoxical reaction in TB. Hmm. Means when the bacteria are dying, there's a hyper hypersensitivity response, and that leads hmm. to tissue destruction all around and abscess increases in some. The development hmm. of a TB lung abscess, especially in neck nodes, etc., is not an indicator that the drugs are not working. The drugs may be working, but there's a high exaggerated response. So one should wait because this response generally settles in six weeks to eight weeks. That is why one should not jump at incision or drainage of an abscess until unless it is about to rupture. It is okay. red hot. Then you have to yeah. drain. And, and there is textbooks mention something about a non-dependent drainage. Does that matter? Uh, it's why, that's why we uh, read up in textbooks. But of course, we found that it doesn't work. It has to be dependent drainage. I see. Okay, so it should be a dependent drainage so that all your abscess gets uh, drained out. Have you seen sinuses in these abscesses in the yes, long term? Very often, but uh, if you drain adequately and remove the disease, uh, lymph nodes, whichever debris, etc., completely, then only they heal. Generally, the failure is inadequate, complete drainage. Inadequate drainage is the cause of failure, or you have not been able to remove because generally it's not a single lymph node. There are multiple clusters of lymph node groups. You have to reach and remove almost all of them as far as possible. And then leave for And sometimes they track pretty deep, isn't it? So would you go chasing the whole thing? Yes, it's pretty deep. And because they are in neck and as thoracic surgeon, sometimes that area is not very familiar to us also. Uh -huh. But it should be done completely. Once you are taking up for surgery, it should be done under general anesthesia. I discourage draining a tubercular abscess under local anesthesia, even in an adult. It should be done in a general anesthesia in a theater like a major procedure. Okay, all right. Now, whenever you operate on patients with tuberculosis, is there a minimum duration of ATT that you like to see before you operate, or uh, you're okay with uh, no, no, doing I'm, it without ATT cover? Almost no case. No, you see, as I mentioned, according to the indication. 
if the indication is suppose a patient comes with massive hemoptysis, he has never received an ATT earlier, then of course I would live, like to give an ATT first six to eight weeks because of two reasons. Number one, patient is still active, the results will be suboptimal, so it's better that he receives ATT. And secondly, hemoptysis may get settled on ATT itself, and patient may never require. Okay. But those patients were post TB sequently, then there is okay. no need to start ATT again for treatment. Absolutely no. If there's a sputum okay. negative patients, post TB sequently are being taken for surgery. We never start ATT. But in the post operative period, if the specimen shows tubercular activity to be still present or AFB, live AFB bacteria being present, then we give additional course of three months anti tubercular. I see. And, and the duration for ATT that you like before surgery? Before surgery, I, as I said, no. If suppose I'm doing for TB sequently, we don't start restart it at all. Okay. Only no, I'm I'm talking about a standard antitubercles and pyema and things like that. Uh, not six, not the emergency. Uh, six, six weeks. weeks. Six weeks. Uh, you're happy with six weeks antitubercles. Good enough. Good enough. Okay. All right. Uh, sir, uh, just one. Uh, you know, th this is purely because we we sit in UK and we never ever use empirical ATT. And in India, I have always seen empirical AT ATT being used. So, just your views on this: uh, what is the role of empirical antitubercular therapy? I also feel that empirical ATT should be discouraged. Oh, because, thank you. Because many cases, which you even in young population, occasional case can be an adenocarcinoma. We have seen number of cases who had an adenocarcinoma being treated as tuberculosis and or a yeah. non-tubercular non infectious disease. There are other things, or non-tubercular mycobacteria or other infections or viral diseases which may present as effusions and they are taken as TB. So, it should, though of course the program says that if there are sufficient signs and symptoms in which tuberculosis, you have not been able to demonstrate tubercular bacteria, but there are other clinical things which say that this is tuberculosis. Then when it may be justified in an occasional case, but every attempt should be made to prove tuberculosis by either demonstrating tubercular bacteria or a granulomatous histopathology. Oh, excellent. Excellent. That's such a valid point, sir. I really appreciate your view on that. So what are your strategies for managing a bronchial stump intraoperative? Say you're doing a lobectomy in a tuberculosis patient. Do you do anything different for the stump or do you just do the lobectomy and come out? Uh, most important is preoperative bronchoscopy to see that the proposed site of bronchial stump is healthy. It does not have endobronchial tuberculosis or redness or inflammation. Okay. Otherwise, I just put a mechanical stapler and we find equally good results. So of course, in the initial period, we attempted putting up, uh, I mean, covering the bronchial stump with intercostal muscles and we did a thesis also. We found no difference in the results. Oh, I see. Okay. In, course, in MDR TB, would you be more inclined in to addition, in see, we, don't do a, we don't do a lot of the only two things. Number one, we should not do a lot of cooking around the bronch. If you okay. um, use a lot of electrocautery and take away the arterial supply of the bronchus, then BPF is more likely to form. Another thing is you don't do a lot of lymph node dissection. Those lymph nodes themselves provide a covering and a vascularized covering to the bronchus stem. In fact, one of the audience has asked this question that, uh, you know, you're taking away the tuberculous cavity in MDR-TB because you want to take away the bacterial load. And, and uh, he has suggested that the bacterial load is also there in the mediastinal lymph nodes. So why should you or should you not do a mediastinal lymph node dissection in TB patients? Yeah. See, and if there are abscesses present, obvious lymph node abscesses present, they are of course drained. But those lymph nodes which are present are most of them are reactionary in nature. It's very, it is not, no study has been done whether bacteria are present in those nodes or not. And some those nodes which are coming easily and they are part of the lung specimen, they are of course removed. But you don't do a systematic lymph node dissection because yeah. it's not needed. It's a benign disease. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in any wait, case, wait. the treatment is, the surgery is not the treatment. Treatment is those drugs only. Surgery is an additional thing to remove those cavities which are preventing the treatment to succeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another question which comes across is left main bronchial stenosis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite difficult to access, isn't it, surgically? So what are your strategies to ensure a successful surgery? For uh, bronchoplastic procedures? Uh, yeah, if you can do a sleeve or, or uh, I don't know, pneumonectomy and things like that. Uh, do you have any special strategies uh, for the left side in the left main bronchial stenosis? Uh, 
we go right up to the carina even on the left side and, and the, after doing the adequate dissection etc one can reach up to the carina and put the stapler as near the carina as possible on the left side it retracts below the arch of the aorta that's why we have very rarely see bronchopleural fissure on the left side on the right side it is seen more often because there is no arch of aorta to cover it okay so so it's not a problem really have you had to have patient on bypass and things like that i have read a couple of papers where uh, they have done because my institution does not have a bypass facility i don't have experience in that area and i think it should not be required in tuberculosis surgery per se it's required for tracheal bronchial surgery of course in some cases there but that is generally not done for tuberculosis tracheal surgery carina surgeries okay all right so now we will start taking the questions from the audience i'll just uh, read them out to you and we'll try and uh, get your answers so uh, what clinical scenarios will make you go towards thoracoplasty and elosier window without even attempting a pneumonectomy without even attempting a pneumonectomy hmm. so what is the clinical you see we are, are we dealing with empyema i think so that's or, what or destroyed asking. lung have, what is the indication destroyed lung i think the question was destroyed lung destroyed lung destroyed lung we never do thoracoplasty or these things okay. rescue surgeon sometimes do a pneumonectomy and add a thoracoplasty but mm -hmm. i prefer and we have seen wrong that most of these cases we can get away without doing a thoracoplasty we should do a pneumonectomy itself and mm -hmm. hope for the best if the patient develops a bronchopleural fistula and empyema then of course the we do a pneumonectomy flare and followed by thoracoplasty later sure. and the incidence What? of bronchopleural fistula in the series that we had studied last was 8 to 9% more okay. on the right side oh. so it is an it is a problem the bronchopleural fistula is there at 8 to 9% okay have you got any tips and tricks for extra pleural approach to pneumonectomy when the pleura is densely adherent see extra pleural approach should be learned by everyone who is attempting to be said because mobilizing the apex intra pleurally sometimes can cause more hemorrhage and if the lung tissue is left there the patient may bleed in the post operative period extra pleural plane when what how when one is opening the chest in the extra, one should do by hand mobilization and near the subclavian vessels if the lung is the anesthetic is collapses the lung at the same time and one uses gentle pressure and a lot of oozing takes place at that time it's better that you put dry mops there this oozing will stop don't try to control the bleeding immediately and then mobilize the lung from apex all over and actually we learned this technique also because we do a lot of thoracoplasty and epicolysis so once you do thoracoplasty and epicolysis you are familiar with that area how to mobilize it gently with your finger, with your hand and actually if the videos that i have shown the youtube videos they are demonstrating that technique very clearly that also has the same site also has uh, it's a Side by Ravindra Divan name only, thoracoplasty procedure being shown, which clearly shows how we mobilize the uh, apex. An extra pleural approach for doing a lung resection is same as we do in thoracoplasty. Because in thoracoplasty we resect ribs and mobilize extra pleurally up to the apex. Okay. One has to be so careful. Far. Apex where there is Simpson's fascia, which is mm -hmm. a thickened Simpson's fascia is an endothoracic fascia, a thickened layer of the endothoracic fascia. It has three bands of sebulum as they call it technically which pull the apex of the lung towards the neck and they right. have to be carefully lysed and with electrocautery away from the subclavian vessels oh, after pulling. okay okay so now the dr saini is asking us this question you said that you must have minimum 6 weeks of anti tuberculous therapy before you operate mm -hmm. is the strategy the same with the pre xdr or xdr pulmonary tb for resection yeah i said that uh, we put the best drugs possible the best regime which is required in that case in consultation with dr saini dr saini already knows we put the patient mm -hmm. on that best regime we decide with in consultation with physician that this case is better that a surgery is also added we work up the patient and patient is put on 3 months of actually for xdr and mdr cases 3 months of the appropriate care and after that we will operate whether the patient has become sputum negative or positive he continues to remain sputum I see. So, so you don't wait till the patient's sputum gets converted to negative. In fact, that is that is the indication. The patient is not becoming sputum negative despite adequate ATT. So that's okay. why we have we have operated that's many cases who are sputum positive, and the results are not much inferior to those who are sputum negative. I see. Okay, fantastic. I have done post-operative course or bronchopleural fistula. We have encountered no difference in the results. 
Oh, I see. So That's so encouraging to hear. Results are not that you don't have VTF. You will, though of course the rate has decreased with better mechanical staplers, etc. But we continue to have, if over 20 years period we see our uh, data, it has 8 to 9 percent incidence of bronchopathy fistula after, after pneumonectomy. But after lobectomy, it is practically zero now. I see. Okay, now a, a real question for really the youngsters in the room. Uh, say you're operating on a patient. On one side, you've got a simple uh, tuberculosis. On the second side, you've got MDR-TB. And in the third theater, you've got XDR-TB. Are your operative strategies different for the three varieties or are they the same? I still didn't get the question. In terms of if you've got an MDR TB, should you actually, is the dissection any different than normal TB or uh, are you more worried about a bronchopleural fistula? That's the question they're asking. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I don't think bronchopleural fistula day rate, but only thing is MDR patient rather are taken up because the decision of treating an MDR case with surgery is taken within two to three years of his starting treatment. So those cases are technically generally easier than the post TB cases because post TB okay. cases come to us after six to seven years of history. So you require more fibrosis, more distortion of anatomy, and that's why the post TB MDR cases are rather technically easier. The dissection is same, okay. except that you, of course, you take all the precautions with bronchial stump in all cases that you don't cook too much, you don't leave a longer stump, and you. Another thing that we have added nowadays is the traditional mechanical stapler had two rows of titanium uh, clips. But the endo stapler has three rows. So I use an endo stapler only for pneumonectomies. I see. Okay. All right. How do you avoid getting into trouble with the esophagus on the right side? And what about the vagus and recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left? About esophagus, we uh, put a rise tube in the beginning only. Before the surgery starts, we ask the anesthetist to put a rise tube. And while mobilizing in the posterior aspect, we try to feel the rise tube and stay away from the esophagus. So that is the precaution that we take. And what is the second question? Recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left. Laryngeal nerve, yeah. Recurrent laryngeal nerve, generally one has to understand its location. And if you avoid dissection in that location, it is near the area where ligamentum arteriosus is there between the aorta pulmonary window. So dissection there should be careful. And recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is generally a very distressing symptom because if we cause that injury, and in TB cases, it is quite possible because of the adhesions, etc. Patients uh, have a this uh, hoarseness of white which persists for a very long time, and we had had cases occasionally. But uh, what you have to do is that you dissect, do the dissection near the pulmonary artery where it is near the hilum rather than towards the aortic side, because at that side the recurrent laryngeal nerve is present. That's the only. But it does happen occasionally. Then one has to send for ENT referrals to do speech therapy and some procedures they do in the the larynx and treat these cases. It's a very distressing. distressing. Uh, okay. A, now, two, yeah, sorry. Two or three cases per year, we do get situations where they get into problems with recurrent laryngeal nerve. Okay. When you're doing TB surgery, uh, how frequently do you find hyalur adhesions which are challenging? And do you routinely transfix cardiac end of the vein if not using a stapler? Okay. Yeah. See, generally what we have seen is if the peripheral adhesions are more challenging, then the hyalur dissection is easier. But sometimes the hyalur dissection is more difficult and the periphery is easier. And occasionally there are both. Both the dissections are difficult. And I don't find that transfixing the vessel proximally on the cardiac side offers any further protection. What we do is we doubly ligate. If you are not using a stapler, we ligate proximally double ligation. And distally, what I do is we dissect up to the branching of the vessel and try to put the ligature after the branching. So there is a sufficient stump. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, we understood that. That's right. So you, you doubly ligate rather double than... Double ligation uh, on the proximal side and on the distal side, the ligature is placed after the branching has started. So we get a sufficient length of the proximal stump of the vessel. That gives us yeah. safety. Sure. Sure. I'm trying to understand this question. The gentleman's asking perioperative use of anti tuberculous drugs as a prophylactic measure. For? 
I, I, I'm not clear. I, I, I think we will have to. Uh, I'm again, again that question. That if the treatment is being, if the surgery is being done for post TB sequelae and the patient is put on negative, we don't give preoperatively any anti tuberculosis. We just okay. give antibiotics in the post operative period also. But if the specimen turns out to be showing some activity, then we give an additional course of ATT for three months. In cases of XDR or MDR TB, in any case, after surgery, patient will receive a full course of treatment. Okay. So he will complete his reg regimen of treatment, which is, which, are, which is indicated by physicians. Because we are doing in between their therapy, MDR and XDR cases, whenever sure. we are doing. Sure. Now, it's one of the things they're asking is, if you do lung surgery for TB, do you look at uh, predicted post-operative values? Yeah, we do see, even for TB, though the same criteria as our standard for malignancy, like one point. 50% of the predicted for lobectomy, 60% of the predicted for pneumonectomy are not necessarily valid in TB cases if there's an extensive destruction of the site which I'm going to remove because that lung, the ventilation perfusion mismatch will actually improve after surgery. So we have, if the patient otherwise is fit, nutritionally fit, we have relaxed these criteria in consultation with anesthetists up to even 0.8 FEV1. We have relaxed these criteria and had an absolutely normal results. It depends upon case to case. So all the assessment, but in those situations, borderline cases, we have to do a cardiopulmonary assessment and then take a look. Okay. We've got Dr. Ui, who is from Malaysia, and it's probably two o'clock in the night there. And uh, he's still online and he's asking us, how do you define destroyed lung on a CT scan? Do you do decortication or do you do lung research? Decortication we do for empyma or fibrothorax. But because the CT scan can show a lung cavity, bronchiectasis, etc., and then we will do a pneumonectomy in those cases. I think his, his question is when you're doing a chronic empyema on, on patients with TB, uh, you know, uh, you, you decide to do a decortication and then the lung may not expand. Not expand. So he's asking, how do you know on CT scan? whether this lung will expand or not expand. So should you actually do a decortication or should you just take away that destroyed yeah, lung? Yeah, if uh, there's an evidence of bronchopleural fistula which is present, especially if when the patient before being taken up for surgery, they already have a tube thoracostomy in. And if there's a lot of air leak which is coming, we know there are multiple bronchopleural fistula which are present. In those situations, mm -hmm. and if the CT scan shows fibro fibrosis in the lung parenchyma or multiple cavities, then we do not offer decortication up front. We make a window thoracostomy and wait for the patient to heal. In my experience on window thoracostomy and adequate drainage, once it is established, 70% of the cases completely heal on window thoracostomy alone. And if they continue to have a space issues, an adequate drainage of pus, then we do a thoracoplasty. I don't do upfront thoracoplasty. I used to do thoracoplasty earlier, but we now we feel that window thoracostomy alone may help a sufficient number of cases. It should not be hurried because thoracoplasty is the final procedure. And even if I have to do a thoracoplasty later on, at least the number of ribs that I will have to resect will decrease if I wait after doing a window thoracostomy for three to four months. But the caveat here is that if you have to do a thoracostomy, you should not Dr. delay it. Sorry, sir. One, one minute. Uh, Dr. Balla, you have to switch off your phone. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Carry on, sir. My uh, uh, system that we have used in our unit is that generally we will consider every case for decortication, provided the patient is fit for decortication and we feel that result with decortication will be good. The situation should be that the lung, underlying lung is healthy. There are no bronchopleural fistula present. It is only the thickened pleura which is encasing the lung. So we expect the lung to expand completely and we will take up the patient for decortication. But if the underlying lung is diseased in terms of fibrosis or multiple cavities or bronchopleural fistula being present, then we will upfront offer a window thoracostomy. In 70 to 75% of cases, over a period of two months to nine months, completely heal on, th on window thoracostomy alone and may not require any other surgery. But other cases, if the space is present and sufficient discharge is there, then we will do thoracoplasty in those cases. So thoracoplasty <coughs> Be deferred for years together. I have seen a, if I have to take up, I have taken up cases in which window thoracostomy was done five, four or five years earlier. If they are taken up for thoracoplasty, the thoracic rib, rib becomes too rigid and 
even after thoracoplasty, the space does not completely collapse and failures of thoracoplasty are seen. So thoracoplasty should be done maximum within six months to one year after doing a window thoracostomy. But there's a subset of patients in whom there are bilateral disease and they're very poor general status. They will never be fit for thoracoplasty. Some of them have to live with a window alone, even if it is not leading to complete healing. Okay. Okay, question. thank you very much. I think uh, this is a very good advice because in my, in my national heart center, um, yes. majority of the patient put on for empyema has, on the CT scan has the feature of what you see. When I do the cortication, the lung is completely destroyed and non-viable. I think this is a good feature to look at. Fibrosis, multiple cavity, and vocal fistula preoperatively identified the CT scan. I can save a lot of uh, energy and time to, to avoid this unnecessary disastrous uh, surgery. Thank you very much. That's a very good pointer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Adrian. Good yeah. to see you. Thank you. So, uh, there's another uh, question which says, you, you, you said that uh, to, uh, in theater, to prevent OT personnel, there is something called as positive pressure ventilation. Is that, is that what you said? Uh, so, so this... Then the surgeon, surgeon, here comes with pressure from the uh, from the rooftop and is sucked out from the lower portion so that no, air should not rise up. It should come from above and uh, get sucked out from the uh, wall in the uh, near the ground, near the floor so this, of the. So this young surgeon is asking: We keep a TB patient in a negative suction room to avoid the spread. So how does a positive pressure in theater protect OT personnel? Because the air keeps on changing continuously and it comes from out, above and goes sucked out from below. That is the idea. I see. Okay. And in fact, yeah. air, air conditioning is routine. If we are having air conditioning as well as a theater without these features, then people getting infected will be huge. I see. Okay. All right. And, uh, Any experience of lung transplantation for bilateral destroyed tuberculous lung? You see, of course, I don't have any experience, but. Uh, uh, I had discussed it with units, especially in Austria, we are doing lung transplant. They say that tuberculosis is not a contraindication. But I don't know anybody has taken up a case of tuberculosis for lung transplantation. It's not a contraindication. A heal sure. tuberculosis fibrosis. But generally the indications are ILD, COPD, or other indications, or cystic fibrosis. Okay. So, so what happens. about a recurrent empyema after pneumonectomy? How do you deal with it? And after pneumonectomy generally has a bronchopural fistula as the cause. <laughs> tube thoracostomy, and after a sufficient duration of tube thoracostomy, do a window thoracostomy. And later on, after pneumonectomy, one will always require a thoracoplasty. But I don't do thoracoplasty in the beginning itself because you, you need to dissect eight to nine ribs. So you give time for the thorax to contract on that side and heal as much as possible and then add a thoracoplasty. Okay. Dr. Saxena is making a point that consultation with a thoracic surgeon is a must before starting a patient uh, on MDR regime. Absolutely. That, that's the kind of thing. Actually, I have done some lobbying and advocacy also in various uh, forums which are deciding what kind of therapy should be given and how they should be managed, what, how the programs, that the thoracic surgical consultation should be mandatory before the treatment is being started. And now that's it has come on most of those physicians have come down. So in aspergilloma with no active tuberculosis, does the management change? Aspergilloma, we should of course always operate if there's an aspergilloma which is present because it is likely to cause hemoptysis later on. So we do a... So, so, but if you are not able to culture tuberculosis, should you empirically start them on anti-tuberculosis or, no, or there is no indication? Anti-tuberculosis therapy or anti-fungal therapy either. But in case the biopsy specimen shows invasion of the fungus, because I feel that aspergillus is a colonizing agent there. It is not a disease producing agent. There. Aspergilloma is just a colonization in a cavity. But if the specimen shows invasion of the fungus in the veins or the vessel, pulmonary vasculature, then we give antifungal therapy for cytosone for four weeks. Okay. And, and what about aspergilloma in multiple lobes? What do you do in that scenario? Uh, see, that's why I said one should be ready to do a pneumonectomy and take the decision from lobectomy to pneumonectomy. It's very difficult to preserve. See, if you try to conserve the lung, a lobectomy, and leave the disease, and especially fibrosis with aspergilloma, 
then patient will end up getting space problems, will suffer much more. It's better to add pneumonectomy up front in these cases. Okay. So whenever I work, work up a case for lobectomy for TB, even in Armenia also I did, I completely, I, it's very important to spend some time for consent. Consent for TB surgery should include number one, the natural history of the disease. Suppose the patient does not get a surgery. Still, you see, many of them will not die. They, keep, they can keep on having hemorrhage, but they may die, they may not die also. The patient should know that he has an option not to go in for surgical money. And what are the benefits, risks, and benefits, and what are the possible complications? So it's important that after that uh, thing is explained to the patient, which is also explained that if I'm taking up for lobectomy, due to certain intraoperative findings, I may have to go in for pneumonectomy. So that is also part of my standard consent. I see. Okay. Because that, now, may be, that may be needed for three reasons. Number one, that you feel that there are sufficient cavities or nodules present in the lower lobe. It, it will not be, it will be injudicious to do a lobectomy. Number two, sometimes even in experienced situations, you may end up injuring a vessel near, near a hilum when a pneumonectomy has to be done. So one has to take a consent that pneumonectomy may have to be done, though will be avoided as far as possible. Can, is there a role for multiple wedge resections? Yeah, of course, in the apex, suppose you are doing a right upper lobe and disease is extending just into the apex of the right lower lobe, apical segment. Then we do a wedge resection because that can be easier. But if it is going into the other segments, the lower segments, basal segments or the medial segments, then it's, it's not, no point doing a wedge resection. Okay. Uh, the, this gentleman is asking if a case with recurrent pneumothorax after even pleurodesis, the lung does not expand. The decortication is very difficult or not possible. What to do in these cases? Uh, is it because post TB pneumothorax? I, I am not clear. I am assuming that he is talking about post TB pneumothorax. Post TB pneumothorax is generally not recurrent because the okay. TB initiates a good fibrotic response. And after a tube thoracotomy, generally, if the lung expands, Okay. Recurrent pneumothorax is very rare because rather <laughs> we have difficulty in entering the chest in TB cases okay. because of the uh, pleurodesis, the nature itself gives a good pleurodesis sure. in, in situations of TB. I have seen recurrent pneumothorax only in cases of COPD or bullous lung disease. Okay. Have you had to do completion pneumonectomy in any case with tuberculosis? Yes. Uh, uh, that's, uh, you see, because if there are fibrotic nodules which are left, and when you have done a lobectomy, then the rest of the lobe expands and sometimes they become active again. It may be just a fibrotic nodule, it gets converted into a cavity. So we have an incidence of four to 5% of cases after doing a surgery for hemorrhage, hemoptysis, in the course of the post-operative period after two to three years developing a hemoptysis again. And then we have to do a completion pneumonectomy. It is much more challenging, I mean technically challenging, but it is, a, it is definitely required in a certain percentage of cases. Okay, fantastic. We actually have Dr. Babatosh with us on the call. Yes, so point I, I, just a minute, sorry. Yeah, the point I wanted to mention that for tuberculosis, earlier, in the earlier era, the philosophy uh, uh, was that if you decorticate a tuberculosis uh, empyema, what you do is the cavities which have collapsed, they expand again and become active again. But that was the period oh, when the good therapy was not available. So similar situation can occur when you do a lobectomy, the expansion of the remaining lung may make a small nodule turn into a cavity. So you may have to do Okay, all right. Uh, Dr. Babatosh, I believe you are on the call with us. Uh, uh, yes, sir, I can listen. I am here only. Good evening, sir. Could you share your good evening, experience good with us uh, with regards to tuberculosis and surgery and any words of wisdom for the young surgeons listening to us? Uh, uh, switch on your phone, sir. Uh, switch on your uh, video if you are decently dressed. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, I am, I am, let me find out video. At the base uh, to the left side, sir. Uh, am I, am I visible, is it, am I visible now? Not yet, sir. Uh, Not yet, then yeah, just, it's, it's uh, probably yes now. Yeah, you are visible now, sir, fantastic. I am visible now, you, yes. you cannot miss me. <laughs> no, sir. So, <laughs> I have been listening very carefully, lot of, uh, most of the points have been discussed. I would like to emphasize a couple of points that uh, already discussed, but uh, for youngsters, as you told me, that I can say that completion pneumonectomy, 
is very important as a decision should be taken very very you know accurately and divan is very right to point out in my experience it is usually required late not immediately not immediately after okay. pneumonectomy specifically for tuberculous disease completion needs to be done very very carefully after some time usually it is required in after a couple of years okay. and another uh, issue let me tell you regarding multiple lesions multiple cavities sometimes it may not be easy to identify whether it is due to tb or due to some other disease if it is tubercular proof then it is better to go for pneumonectomy yes. mm -hmm. if it is not proved to be tubercular or uh, say mdr tb or whatever tb it is not tubercular just like sometimes it comes to hydrate their lung resection should be taken very cautious it is all lung conservation multiple cavities tb it is for resection multiple cavity non tubercular we should be conservative uh, uh, these are the points on active tuberculosis sometimes it is very difficult to decide and that dictates the outcome uh, earlier there may not be bacteriological or uh, any other evidence of tuberculosis after surgery uh, if evidence is there of tuberculosis histopathologically or, or uh, bacteriologically yes we start tb but sometimes there is some gray area the one may be uh, may be giving more information about this couple of cases we don't find evidences of active tuberculosis mm -hmm. but then may end with complication so today we don't believe in empirical anti tubercular but how long to continue that is a difficult question sometimes it is really dicey how long to continue anti tubercular and what, let me uh, touch you another uh, rather that is uh, important area regarding which i'm discussed just now the uh, empyema yes. mr definitely we have discussed for youngster let me summarize it is always always decortication after that we review if a portion of segment is gone so decortication plus lung resection maybe segmentectomy lobectomy if entire lung is gone or multiple cavities then empyema decortication plus pneumonectomy that goes by the name of pleuro pneumonectomy even if is there is problem and we are not comfortable that we may expect uh, you know uh, recurrent uh, next problem better not to do thoracoplasty in that setting as divan has very rightly pointed out let us uh, keep uh, thoracoplasty for later sitting so yes. this is the Two points I thought we must discuss, but it was a brilliant discussion. Divan, Dr. Zamir, you have uh, digged out all the issues relating to uh, the tubercular lung disease. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I've got Dr. Rajkumar Yadav with us Yadav on, online, and and he's asking you uh, biopsy after lung resection. How you decide that active tuberculosis is present and start anti-tuberculous therapy? In cases of aspergilloma, or you wait for AFB to be seen on culture. Dr. Yadav, you can come on, uh, switch on your microphone. I think the question and is still video. clear because this, this was a, I told my anti, anti tubercular policy that routinely it is not given. Only if the specimen shows activity, granulomatous lesion, then we add a three months course of anti tubercular therapy. But if AFB are seen, that is why it is important to see. AFB, then we have to do the we have to send the specimen in two separate areas, one for microbiological analysis and one for histopathological analysis. So if you put the specimen in formalin, then you cannot culture bacteria. And dead bacteria are very often present. So that is the to start AKT. Dead bacteria are seen in 27 to almost 4% of the specimens being infected for TB, even after the disease is completely healed. So it has to be cultured. For culturing the specimen, you have to divide the specimen into two areas. One has to be given to microbiology, you will put it on LPA, leave it to assay, and do a culture sensitivity. And then, if you are able to culture the bacteria, then, and then only there is an indication for the PTP again. Otherwise, there is no. Okay, th thank you very much, sir. Did you want to say something, Dr. Yadav? Okay. I, I, just, I just wanted to congratulate him and uh, most of the places uh, the activity is started uh, before any, uh, you know, the biopsy. Most of the case of aspergilloma, yes, 
IFC usually shows chronic uh, inflammatory reaction. Reaction only reaction. And um, not uh, gondometers that is uh, your uh, uh, casting necrosis etc. But most of the time it presents a chronic inflammatory reaction. So in that case, if you are suspecting acute tuberculosis, so you wait for uh, the AP culture report to come. Or you start the uh, ATTs empirically before. You said unsuspecting activity. On what yeah. basis are we unsuspecting? Yeah. The symptom of hemoptysis is not to suspect TB. Activity. Yeah. activity is only if the patient had fever or something else in the big low grade fever which is persistent. No, no, I mean just on the basis of biopsy report. Biopsy report if there's fever a in the post in the post operative cases, fever can be off because of many reasons. Many it cannot be because of acute tuberculosis. The biopsy shows a granuloma. So, the uh, granuloma. Then we yeah. treat it as a matter of precaution for treatment. But then bacteria are cultured. If culture also is bacteria, then it is for a complete second course of treatment. Okay. All right, sir. Thank you very right, much, right. Uh, everybody. Okay. Thank you for thank you. Uh, this. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for this uh, really enlightening discussion. Uh, thank you very uh, much. On behalf of uh, the whole country, actually, I'd like to thank Dr. Devan for uh, taking up this bandwagon of thoracic surgery in tuberculosis. I mean, your contribution to the, to the country's health cannot be underestimated. It's just amazing what you've done. You've given your whole life uh, for this very difficult uh, set of patients. So I, I personally salute you and personally, on behalf of everybody, would like to thank you for pushing the envelope of surgery to such a great extent. Uh, and uh, again, thank you very much for coming and enlightening us with your knowledge. Uh, it, it is just phenomenal. Uh, we all learned a lot and it's a very humbling experience to listen to you and see your uh, you know, analysis of, of tuberculosis. Thank you very much, sir. And we will put this uh, video on the uh, Thoracic Guru's uh, uh, YouTube channel. So anybody who wants to ask any more questions, uh, feel free to write to us and we'll try and answer them uh, for on behalf of all, uh, all the youngsters. Thank you very much.